Good evening, my fellow scientists. It is Sunday, April 8th, 2018, and I want to give you the weekly update on the iron battery. This week, I have assembled and tested an EDTA-based cell per the plan that I laid out last week and with the cell that I will show here. In this cell, both anode and cathode solutions are dark because I've saturated both sides with iron EDTA. On the left side, the anode side, that's iron 2 EDTA. It's essentially just a spectator. And on the right side there, is iron 3 EDTA and that is going to take up the electron as the iron oxidizes. And I know this is working because when I was done discharging this cell I looked at the iron anode and it looks like this. It's got a nice iron oxide hydroxide patina on it indicating that rather than generating iron 2 EDTA that is soluble and floats away I'm generating an iron two species that's solid right next to the cell. It remains to be seen if that's going to be re very reversible in fact, based on this, if it were perfectly reducible, this sawtooth charge discharge curve would look perfectly symmetrical. It wouldn't be drifting toward the top. This indicates that I am using more current to charge than I am getting out when I discharge. Could be due to any number of things, but my bet is on irreversible iron oxidation. We can fix that. I know it's possible because the Edison cell does it. If you're interested in the iron nickel, Edison cell, that's a great historical battery, but is not where we're going with this cell. But it's the same anode, and so it should work. That being said, I have three metrics I've decided to use to characterize each battery going forward. This battery has an open cell potential of about 0.5 volts. It has a Coulombic efficiency of about 50%, that is to say about half of the electrons that flow into the battery are then recovered when it discharges and flows out of the battery. And then the third is capacity. And you can see here that I discharged for 10 hours initially and didn't quite hit the end. And then I discharged for another nine hours and finally was able to see a, a tailing off as it ran out of juice. That suggests when all was said and done that this cell stored about 18 coulombs. So given that number of coulombs that has moved through, we can compare that to the number of coulombs that should be moved through if everything is perfect. It's a little electrochemistry here. If we have a 0.01 liter of solution and one molar, that's 0.01 moles of iron 3 EDTA. It should be able to accept 0.01 moles of electrons. Use the 96485 coulombs per mole, and we get approximately 0 0.0016 moles of electrons that we moved. That's only 1.6% of the number of moles we should have moved. So evidently, uh, we're not being very efficient, so why? And my suggestion is still that that iron oxide hydroxide caked wire is probably no longer a very good participant in this reaction. Again, that can be solved, used a much higher surface area form of iron, iron powder, iron wool, as the electrode instead of that chunk of iron wire will get much better performance. But for the time being, we have a, a, a baseline metric for all of our tests going forward. Special thanks to my undergraduate student Nico who put together this cell. Uh, we're going to use this as baseline to compare to an iron sucrose, an iron fructose, an iron sulfate, and an iron cyanide cell over the following week or two. It seems to take about a week to do a cell, but I think we can get that to two cells per week uh, now that we know exactly what metrics we want to look at. So stay tuned next week. We're going to have at least one more, hopefully two more of these different chemistries to compare, and I'll show the grid of these three performance metrics, cell potential, symmetry of the charge-discharge curve, and overall capacity next week right here in the Allen Lab.